Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for another one of HydroTerra's webinars. Got a fantastic number of registrants today. It's close to a record, if not a record. So clearly this topic is of interest. Uh, today's topic, acid sulfate soil management, exploring recent changes to the guidelines. So on behalf of HydroTerra, I'd really like to thank Sue, Ann, Sue Ellen Deer and Christy Williams, who both are land resource officers with the Queensland Department of Resources. And they've been busy compiling new guidance in this area. Before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, I would like to thank the traditional owners Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boonawurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So I'm Richard Campbell, Managing Director of Hydroterra, and it's always a pleasure to host these webinars. There's a picture of Sue Ellen, She's the Senior Land Resource Officer with the Queensland Department of Resources and Christy Williams, Land Resource Officer also with the Queensland Department of Resources. So we're lucky today. We've got two presenters and uh, they're going to spend a lot of time going through their new guidance documentation. A little bit about Sue Ellen. I'm just going to have to shrink the format here. How do I do that? I got out of the way somehow. There it is. Sue Ellen is a senior land resource officer with the Department of Resources since 1992. She has worked in central, southern and more recently northern Queensland in soils, land resource survey and acid sulfate soil. Sue Ellen is based in Nambour and still does the odd acid sulfate soil assessment for major infrastructure projects, presents workshops for local government with Christy and is writing lots of guidelines at the moment for soils, land resource survey, land suitability assessment and acid sulfate soil. Christy is a land resource officer with the Department of Resources, starting work in Brisbane in 1999 she was part of Quasit, the department's yep. acid sulfate soils group, for seven years and was heavily involved in all things acid sulfate soil, running workshops, writing guidelines and during doing site assessments. Chrissy has been based in the Toowoomba office since 2006 and while she's still involved in acid sulfate soil work, these days she works more on normal soils, salinity, <laughs> soil conservation and land resource assessment. We love your questions and expecting lots and lots of questions today, given the number of people here. To do that, you use your Q&A button, which is at the top of your screen, and we will read out those questions. We also have a number of early bird questions that have come in, so really appreciate those as well we do the early bird questions first. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? Well, we like to share knowledge, we like to facilitate education, and we like to work with industry leaders. So many thanks um, for our, from our presenters today for showing us some leadership in the area of acid sulfate soil. Before we move to them, just a quick um, advertisement, if you like to mention, we've got a groundwater sampling workshop coming up. If you're interested in getting groundwater sampling training, please get in touch with HydroTerra. All right, so without further ado, I will hand over to our presenters. Okay, well, I'll um, start today. So thanks and welcome everybody. So Christy and I are really happy to be here today to talk to you about the wonderful world of acid sulfate soils. It's so great to see so many interested people logging in. Um, it's a bit sort of strange doing this as a webinar, I have to say. 
can't hopefully you'll get some of my jokes and <laughs> hopefully at least Christy and Richard might laugh so I'll know if yeah, we'll laugh. <laughs> so it really demonstrates that after all these years there's real this is this a new generation of scientists and engineers along with us old older folk um, who are still interested in this topic um I mean, especially since I think this is the second acid sulfate soil themed um, webinar that um, HydroTerra has run in the last six months or so. So with this many people on board, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So it's clear that there's a real um, demand or thirst for this knowledge on acid sulfate soils. So we're going to do a bit of a tag team approach today. We couldn't really decide on who should do what, so we decided we'll just jump in and out. So it might be a little, hopefully it won't be too clunky. <laughs> Um, um, hopefully we'll get some fairly smooth transitions um, between us. So over to you, Christy. <laughs> Thanks to Ellen. Um, yes, it's lovely to see so many people online. And yeah, I'll laugh at your jokes, even if nobody else does, so that's all right. Um, given that the numbers of people that are online, I'm assuming that there's quite a wide range of um, knowledge and experience that you all have with acid sulfate soils. There's probably some of you online who deal with this stuff like every day. There's an acid sulfate soil investigation report or a management plan or lab results that come across your desk every day. Some of you maybe only a couple of times a month and then there may be um, somewhere it's only a couple of times a year. So we're not going to spend a lot of time today talking about what these soils are or how to identify them or where you find them, how many boreholes you should dig, um, what lab results or anything like that. We are doing a deep dive straight into the management side of it. So if you're not super familiar with this topic, it may be a little bit full on, um, but there is lots of other information out there that you can go to if you want some more stuff. As Sue Ellen said, Mark Stuckey gave a great talk for HydroTerra at the end of last year. Um, our Queensland government website has loads of stuff on acid sulfate soils on there. I know that Southern Cross Uni do um, professional short courses on this topic. There is stuff out there. Sometimes the problem is that there's so much information you actually don't know where to go. Um, you can also always contact Sue Ellen or myself. We're happy to talk after the webinar if there's um, further information that you'd like. So I'm going to go really, really quickly, uh, like a couple of slides and just describe what are acid sulfate soils and why we care enough about them to manage them. Um, when we do our training workshops, usually we spend a couple of hours introducing this topic. So I'm going to give you a three minute special. So if I can go to the first slide, please, Richard. So what are they? First up, they're soils and sediments that contain iron sulfides, okay? Um, that's what makes them special compared to everything else. The main form of that iron sulfide that's present in and then there's something called pyrite, and that's FES2. And that's some pyrite crystals under a microscope that you can see there that Lee Sullivan took. So those pyrite crystals are extremely small with a really large surface area, which means they're highly reactive. You can see they're kind of like little raspberry shapes. They're called framboids, those big surface areas. You may have heard of pyrite before when you talk about fool's gold in a mining sort of situation where you can actually pick the chunks of pyrite up and play with them. This is the same stuff chemically, but it's such a big difference in terms of their surface area. So these things react really quickly. And so when they're exposed to oxygen or these soils are disturbed, and that can occur by physically excavating the soil, or it can occur by lowering the water table. So both things can disturb these soils. The pyrite breaks down really rapidly, undergoes a whole pile of chemical reactions called oxidation, and we generate sulfuric acid, which comes from that little S part, and we generate lots of soluble iron. So if I go on to the next slide, we talk a lot about potential actual acid sulfate soils and actual acid sulfate soils. So potential acid sulfate soils are before they've been exposed to oxygen. So the iron sulfides in them are unoxidized. They are sitting there quite happy. They have a neutral pH. They have the potential to oxidize if they're disturbed. But So if you were to go out right now and stand like underneath a mangrove, what you're standing on is potential acid sulfate soils. And everything's all fine and dandy if you leave it alone. Next little bit, please, Richard. If you, once they start being exposed to oxygen, um, they start that oxidation process, they become actual acid sulfate soils um, where they are actually acid. The pH has dropped down to less than four. And they often contain some of the byproducts of that oxidation, which is this little yellow mineral called jarosite. And jarosite's a really good indicator of our actual acid sulfate soils. It likes to hang out when the pH is about 3.7. So there's not a lot of things that do that in the natural environment. Now, 
Okay, so that's what happens when, you know, what's the difference between them. You can't have a talk about acids or fat soils without chemistry, okay? There's loads of chemistry involved in it. I'm only going to do one equation today, and if you're not feeling like doing chemistry at lunchtime, just read the words underneath it. But chemically, it's what happening, what's the overall um, oxidation reaction is that you have pyrite plus oxygen plus water, and you produce iron and sulfuric acid. And that um, iron and sulfuric acid are not the only things. That acid reacts in the soil, affects, affects it mobilizes aluminium and other metals and things that are free too so you get like a bit of a toxic brew that can come out so if our soils are um, the disturbance is poorly planned or managed we can get lots of problems water quality environmental damage infrastructure human health concerns there's a whole swag of things that can go on so that is my three minute special about what these soils are and why we worry about them and i'm going to hand over to you so for the next bit okay well um so we're here to talk about this beautiful oh you can't see it i can't see it. there it is <laughs> so i won't hold that one up again <laughs> okay. oh hang on it'll work on mine i'll hold it up there see this document there you go <laughs> okay perfect okay so there's so many different uh guidelines out there on acid sulfate soils and then of course there's so many different pieces of legislation and policy as well to, to navigate and um we've got sampling guidelines we've got lab methods guidelines we've got dredging guidelines groundwater guidelines mbo guidelines in queensland as well we've got the monitoring and sampling manual uh, for the environmental protection policy that desi put out and if you can press the slide richard and then when it comes to management of course there's really only one guideline so although in the past Many of the different jurisdictions have um, strategically grabbed certain sections out of them to put in um, to use for their own regulatory or, or policy environments. So hopefully now that we've got an updated version, um, the links to all of those different pieces of legislation and policy and guidelines, maybe hopefully they might be a little bit more clear than they were in the past. And hopefully now we've got some greater consistency across the country. But bearing in mind, you've got to bear in mind that there's always going to be specific state or local government um, requirements that may override some of the more general environment advice that we have in the acid sulfate soil soil management guidelines so excellent we switched already good <laughs> okay okay so um we've wrote the guidelines effectively to offer procedural advice about how to avoid environmental harm and to effectively try and demonstrate best practice um this provides more certainty to industry and regulatory decision makers. So we all sort of know where we stand. Um, the guidelines are really both focused around nine management principles. Um, they used to have eight, but we, you know, we decided that a ninth was necessary because we, some of our, with our knowledge increases our um, um, things that we need to be covering off from these guidelines as well, which is why we've, we've grown management principles. We also have a good section on acid sulfates or risk assessments, which are another fairly substantial part of the guidelines. And they outline management strategies, such as preferred management strategies, high risk management strategies, and unacceptable management strategies. So, Excellent. And one more. Thank you. So all of those management strategies carry environmental risks. So even those preferred management strategies, they're not necessarily suitable for every site. So each site is completely unique. You've got different soils, different site characteristics, different groundwater hydrology, some areas in the middle of an urban infill environment, some are, are, are big, you know, green, green sites as well. So that's why risk assessment is so important to really look at the big picture um, so that the management on the site actually matches the risk. Okay, so we thought we'd just dabble into a little bit of the process because it's been a long process. So we, we sort of feel that we need to share the history with you guys. <laughs> so, so basically um, back in 2002, Christy and I were involved in writing the original version of the soil management guidelines. At the time, all we had was the faucet sampling guidelines that um, the that actually went into 
a bit of management, a bit of legislation, a, a, a bit of lab stuff, a bit of everything, but and, but predominantly sampling as well. So um, Colin Burney wrote that back in 1996 um, and the other uh, major document that was used was the New South Wales uh, manual. The I think it was released in 1998. So in 2014, we updated the guideline because our knowledge and expertise had grown along with industry's knowledge and expertise. So we needed to update the guideline. Then, of course, in 2014, the national guidance was was released. Oh, so 2018, well, sorry. Sorry. 2018. <laughs> Correct. That's what, I, that's what I said in my head. <laughs> Okay, so it didn't take us long to realise, to notice some of the differences between the Queensland guidelines and the national guidelines. So um, we quickly updated our website to try and um, stave off, you know, some inconsistencies, but we soon realised that we needed to do more. And then, so we did that in 2019. In 2020, during COVID lockdown, we started rewriting the guidelines. And in 2021, we formed a new industry reference group and we started consultation with that group. So, and I'm pretty sure some of those people in our reference group are hopefully listening today. Uh, thanks for um, putting up with us, harassing you for sharing your expertise. And an interesting fun fact for you is that four members of our original industry reference group have been there for all three versions of the guidelines. So yay to those four people who've generously evolved with us and with the Queensland guidelines. So their assets of it's all life is just like just like Christy and I and Gus as well, who's our other author, the remaining current Queensland government employer. Okay, so anyway, I, I digress. So um, we compiled the feedback into a gigantic spreadsheet and we did notice that naturally when you consult with that many people, there are a variety of opinions out there. And so we identified a series of issues that we needed to resolve before we could publish. So we were fortunately able to get together at the National Assets of Wet Soils con Conference in Adelaide last year, where we just um, got up and invited everyone to come along and join our reference group. Not everyone came, but um, we did have a... Uh, a big bunch of academics and industry reps and regulators who all sat in and um, shared some, uh, we, de we developed some fairly pragmatic solutions to some of our problems. So it's a really good thing having these roundtable discussions with industry regulators and academics. And um, yeah, we got, we got some good outcomes. So then we released some further, we came back and made another gigantic spreadsheet um, compiled it, it, sent it out to the reference group again, and then on World Soil Day last year. Um, we can move over. Next one, please, Richard. Then um, on World Soil Day last year, we were able to release the guidelines, which we we're very excited about. So um, but I think we actually realised it was actually in our library catalogue the Friday beforehand. So I was on holidays by that stage on rec leave by World Soil Day, so Christy had to got the pleasure of hitting the press button and send it to all our local governments and industry people and the massive big, um, uh, Christy's got a great big database of all of these people interested in assets of its soil, so we got it out to them on World Soil Day. Okay, next one, please, Richard. So um, throughout all of our meetings and, and feedback sessions, there was really an overwhelming consensus that what we needed was consistency with the national guidelines. We wanted, um, there was a need for greater certainty <clears throat> and clear direction. To quote one of our experts, industry is seeking more than an ill-defined on occasion statement or, or another one. Um, the statement may well prove to be an open door to inappropriate asset management. So with that sort of feedback, we knew that we were talking to the right people. So effectively, um, we, after all of this consultation, we made some amendments to the purpose. Um, any of you who know the 2014 guideline will know that the purpose went for many, many pages, I think. It's now one small paragraph. Uh, we got rid of one chapter as well, although we added lots of extra stuff as well at the end. Uh, we added the extra management principle. We modified risk assessments. We looked at the neutralisation section, the verification testing section, 
the non-sulfuric acid sulfate soils, self-neutralizing soils. And then we added some stuff about, we looked at, had a closer look at small disturbances, the filling section and closure reporting. We added heaps of new stuff, like heaps more as tips, because we love those conceptual site um, models, checklists, unconfined groundwater dewatering sections, stuff on dredging, remediation case studies, water quality parameters, and then my personal favourite is a poem at the end on the sulphidization process. Okay, so um, obviously we can't go through everything today, so we're just going to sort of try and discuss just the major themes of the guidelines and then the major changes along the way. Okay, so one more please, Richard. So we're going to start off looking at risk assessments. So version 3.8 of the guidelines, version 4.0 of the guidelines and version 5 have all reiterated that a risk assessment should always be done before you disturb any acid sulfate soils. So we're going to keep reinforcing that a bit today. It might sort of, if we tell it, tell you that, um, if we repeatedly remind you, hopefully that'll sink, sink in. Um, the management guidelines highlight this right at the beginning of the guidelines. You have to do a risk assessment before you disturb acid sulfate soils. Okay, so a risk assessment involves an acid investigation, soils analysed in a lab, and that's not with the field tests, and groundwater investigation. They all have to be done in accordance with the national guidelines. Okay, so what is an acid investigation? Well, it's not changed since Colin Burney came up with the concept back in 1996. So it's a desktop assessment followed by a site inspection with some soil sampling, laboratory analysis, and then reporting of results. So too easy. Okay, and the risk assessment can also benefit from the use of conceptual diagrams. So we're very fortunate that um, PSK and Silvana in Brisbane um, generously um, did some workshops for us, and then we stole some of her conceptual site models. So thanks to, <laughs> thanks to PSK. Okay, so they're basically planning and decision-making tools that you can use, and they're just really good because they have an illustrative representation of, of the things that can go up on, on a site. One of the other changes to the guidelines is, or additions, is that we've included the definition of a suitably skilled and experienced person in acid sulfate soil science. So um, the science of acid sulfate soils is really complex, and especially when you've got interactions between many different disciplines. So engineering, civil engineering, soil science, geochemistry, groundwater hydrologists. So, and the risks to the environment to the built infrastructure and human health are fairly significant if things go wrong. So it is a really specialist field. So we thought it warranted a fairly detailed description of what constitutes a suitably skilled and experienced person in acid sulfate soil science. We also introduced the concept of independent third party review. Nothing new out there in the world of contaminated land, but uh, new to the world of acid sulfate soils. So it uh, can be a component of a closure report. And now I'm going to hand over to Christy. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. Just, so, just before we do, oh, sorry, yes. so on this slide, it's are you saying that it's mandatory for them to be a certified practising soil scientist to be competent? No, we're not saying it's mandatory. We're saying it's recommended that the, that you're either a, C, a certified practicing soil scientist or a registered soil practitioner, or you're some sort of an accredited environmental scientist or engineer with 10 years experience. You can be any of those things and that's um, considered um, meeting the definition. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right, so management strategies. Um, yeah, we've done all this guff talking about what we've done to get to the guidelines. We still haven't told you what the management strategies are. So the number one uh, management strategies is always avoidance. It really should be considered for every site. It's the cheapest and easiest option. Like all of the management strategies and like what Sue Ellen just said, it um, really depends on having a thorough site investigation. You can't avoid something if you don't know where it is. And so that avoidance can be as simple as, you know, if you're doing a two-storey basement car park 
path and you suddenly decided you've encountered acid sulfate soils at several meters below ground you might be able to change your site layout and everything so it's only a one-story basement car park things like that to try to avoid this disturbance it is always the preferred strategy it's the number one management principle in the guidelines but we also know that disturbance is not always uh, that avoidance is not always possible so if you are going to disturb it the preferred management strategies for dealing with acid sulfate soils are minimization of disturbance neutralization hydraulic separation and strategic reburial and we'll talk a little bit about each of these through the document so that no not yet Richard go back <laughs> So the management guidelines for each of these preferred management strategies, they outline the environmental risks for them, because as we've said, even these preferred ones, can st things can still go wrong. So there are still environmental risks associated with them. Uh, the guidelines talk about the management considerations and the performance criteria that you have to meet. We've made a few tweaks in the guidelines to minimization of disturbance, hydraulic separation, and strategic reburial. But the one we've most played around with is the neutralization chapter. And it is by far the longest section of the guidelines because it is um, the most common uh, management strategy that people use. Now we'll go to the next one, um, just the title. Before I just go into neutralization and some of the changes there, I just wanted to talk really quickly about net acidity. And so if you're familiar with acid sulfate soils, you'll know what net acidity is. It's basically you've done your site investigation, you've got a sample, you've sent it to the lab, you've got lab results, and they'll report back your net acidity, which is basically saying how much acid this soil could produce if you were to dig it up and just leave it alone. And um, the net acidity now, we've changed the, um, the, the formula for it, but the net acidity, once you have those values, you compare it to your action criteria. And the action criteria are like a trigger to say when you need to manage them. If your net acidity is higher than the action criteria, you need to manage those soils. And the action criteria differ depending on your soil texture and how much soil you're going to disturb. If you're disturbing more than a thousand tons of um, acid sulfate soils or soil, then the net, the action criteria are 0.03% S or 18 moles of hydrogen per ton. So if your net acidity exceeds that number of 0.03% S, then you've got to manage those soils. Just the thing with the action criteria is that if your net acidity is less than the action criteria, it's still an acid sulfate soil, but you just don't, it's not triggering the need for management. So if I go to the next little point here, so the now our net acidity calculations align with the national guidelines. So net acidity is potential sulfitic acidity plus actual acidity plus retained acidity. So if you remember that talk right at the start where I said we have our potential acid sulfate soils sitting there below the ground, they're all full of pyrite. That pyrite part is our potential um, sulfitic acidity. If the soils have started to oxidize and they're already producing acid, you'll also get measurable actual acidity, which is our exchangeable part, and retained acidity. And the retained acidity is the stuff that's locked up in jarosite and schwermanite and other minerals like that. So you have all these acid components of your soil which contribute to the net acidity. Now, in some soils, you do get alkalinity in them or acid neutralizing capacity. And obviously uh, acidity and alkalinity, they kind of counteract each other. So if you go to the next point, the major change is that, that you can only use a soil's inherent acid neutralizing capacity or ANC if it's been corroborated by other data that demonstrates the soil material doesn't experience acidification during complete oxidation. And this is exactly what the national guidelines have said. So that's a way of saying, how do you corroborate that? How do you prove that? Well, it's basically a range of kinetic testing that you have to do. So slab incubation tests or chip tray tests and things like this. When this first sort of came out as a concept, there was a bit of pushback from industry because the thing with those kinetic tests is that they take time. You're talking about a minimum of two months, sometimes longer to get the results from that. And so everyone was like, oh, do we, what are we going to do about this? Sort of thing and we've worked through industry and i'm going to spend a, this slide and next one sort of talking about the resolution that we've came to and why um, it's important to go with this national approach um, so i guess the other thing i really want to point out is this this consideration of acid neutralizing capacity it's only something to deal with if you're talking about a self-neutralizing soil it's not actually super super common i've been in this field for about two decades, which is a really long time. And I've come across assessing a lot of acid sulfate soil management plans and investigation reports. And I reckon I can count on both hands the number of times that we've had something with self-neutralizing um, 
um, self neutralizing soil and a, and a measurable ANC that we have to consider. So it's out there, but it's not super, super common. So if I go to the next slide, Richard, which is about our self neutralizing soils, they can be um, partially or completely self neutralizing, and it's due to an abundance of naturally occurring calcium carbonate, which is usually in the form of shells. So they have an alkaline pH. Um, greater than seven and a half, often it's greater than eight and a half. We've done mapping in Queensland and I know other jurisdictions have done mapping too. In Queensland, we've identified small areas of these um, self neutralizing soils, usually in harbour and estuarine sediments and things like that. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of research, uh, mainly coming out of um, some of the universities, looking at this self neutralizing or the ANC component. And what they've actually found is that shells need to be less than half a millimeter. So that's pretty small. And they're the ones that are going to um, actually have some ANC, some self neutralizing there. So I'm just looking at that less than sign on the slide. Shells, um, that should be the other way. Shells greater than half a millimetre um, are the ones that are going to um, not be any good. So the shells have to be teeny tiny and that's what the lab results have shown. And the reason for that is twofold. The bigger shell fragments, once that acidity gets in with the calcium carbonate in the shell, you can get iron and gypsum and other insoluble compounds which are coat the shells and then so they're no longer effective. Also samples which are then sent, you collect and send them to a lab, after they've dried the sample, they'll grind them so break all those shells up. And so you're getting an overestimation of what the um, acid neutralizing capacity could be. And we've, there've been examples over in Western Australia, for instance, where they've done their site investigation perfectly. Um, they've shown that they, they had these ANC results. So they substantially reduced liming rates. Um, and then they've gone on and implemented that on site and they've ended up with a whole pile of acidic drainage and things because the ANC was an overestimation of what was actually um, available in real world conditions. The reason why we've done this change of saying, yep, let's just stick with the ANC that's being corroborated by other data is that it's due to the uncertainty of whether the the neutralizing material in the soil is quick enough to counteract the acidity. So it's about those reaction kinetics. You remember something that's finely ground in the lab, is that real, can that translate to real world conditions? Um, when you do your field testing as part of an acid sulfate soil investigation, you do your little field tests with PHF and PHFOX. These self neutralizing soils will both have a PHF and FOX above seven and a half. So if you're starting to see that in your field condition, in your field testing, that's when you're like, okay, maybe I need to start thinking that self neutralizing soils or some sort of ANC is apparent. And you can start that process of doing those longer term incubation tests, kinetic testing, um, and you've still got time throughout the development assessment process. So that's why um, a bit of the background onto the change of that. So if we'll go on to the next slide, we'll actually talk about neutralization. As I said, it's one of the most common um, management techniques for acid sulfate soils. It involves incorporating alkaline material into the soil. And there's gotta be enough there to neutralize all your actual and retained acidity that's there right now, plus all the potential acidity that could be generated in the future if those iron sulfides are oxidized. So because we need something that hangs around, you really need some sort of um, sparingly soluble, insoluble um, neutralizing agents. And that's why fine ag lime or calcium carbonate is the most common one. So if, during this talk, if you hear us talking about liming, we're talking about fine ag lime. So it has like a purity of about 95, or probably 98%, um, a really high effective neutralizing value. It's a good stuff. So it's really easy to say, I'm gonna lime treat these soils, that'll be fine. And while it is a relatively simple process, you know, we've got the equipment to do it, you know how to do it. There's a huge pile of considerations to do neutralization. And sometimes people, I think, don't quite think enough about it. And that's why we've written so much more, I guess, into this chapter. So texture obviously plays a big deal. I'll talk about that in a second impacts on wildlife if you're doing your site is uh, next to a naturally you know acidic environment you don't want to chuck heaps of lime and alkaline product around and potentially change the chemistry in your surrounding environment uh, choice of neutralizing agent there are different things out there other than ag lime that can be used obviously um, calculation of liming rates isn't this straightforward like you can get a sample one sample get one net acidity result work out one liming rate 
But then how do you do that across an entire site where you might have variable numbers, net acidity here, net acidity there? Like what, how do you do your overall liming rates? You've got to think about meeting verification testing. You actually need space to do it. Um, and what else is there? And you've got to be able to track your soils and things like that. So there's a lot of things to think about when you just say, oh, we'll just do neutralization. So if we go on to the next slide, thanks, Richard. Um, a bit about texture. So sands they dry quicker so they're easier to work they generally have lower levels of iron sulfides and they have, but they have a low buffering capacity and they can start oxidizing really quickly like within hours of being exposed so you can generate quite large volumes of contaminated leachate quickly we have the next slide which is about our marine clays at the opposite end of the spectrum these things can be really difficult to work uh, treat and dry they are wet they're like the consistency of toothpaste in some cases and so it's pretty tricky to, it takes time for them to dry out enough that you can actually work in it. Because neutralization relies on the fact that the ag lime has to be incorporated into the soil. Like it's got to actually mix. And that's because ag lime is so sparingly soluble. It's got to be moved. You've got to actually place it where you want it to go. It's not going to freely move that easily, that readily. So clays especially can take a really long time to dry out, especially in wet season in say tropical North Queensland. Um, so they can be fun to deal with at times as well. So the next slide um, is about our treatment pads. So we did a really simplified, I don't know, diagram back in 2002. We've improved our artistic skills slightly since then, and we've updated this to just show all the components that's necessary. And I guess the big thing about a treatment pad is that it has to be hydrologically isolated. We want to keep everything in this area, and that's why bunding is so important, the leachate collection drains, having a compacted and pervious base to stop anything moving downwards. It must have a guard layer of agricultural lime, so that's placed on the ground on top of that compacted base before you put your acid sulfate soils on there to that required treatment and then you're mixing in with the lime. And another thing when you're working out liming rates is that we always incorporate a safety factor and the minimum one is about 1.5 and that's just to account for ineffective mixing, um, any coatings and things like that on there. So we add a little bit extra um, on top of the net acidity results and that's been recommended since way back when. So that, that part hasn't changed. So if you go to the next slide, these are actual just, treatment pads. Oh, yes? Just before we do, so impervious base, mm -hmm. are, are there actual parameters on impervious? Like, do you have Yeah, we, we, we haven't gone down to specifying like hydraulic, you know, conductivity and things like that, but there are, there are some extra, there's a whole paragraph in there and the guidelines about it. So you can, I'll read it out to you, but we can have a look at it later. <laughs> You can either bring in clean fill and that becomes your, you know, impervious base or depending on the site characteristics, you can compact the soil in situ. So that's a different change doing the in, in situ compaction. So, but we haven't sort of said it must have, you know, hydraulic conductivity, permeability of this or whatever like that. We haven't gone into that specifications. Um, so these are just some examples of treatment pads in real life. They range from, I don't know, the size of a house <laughs> to something gigantic, uh, just depending on that space that is available. And you can see, I don't know, can you see my mouse moving there? No. no. No, that's right. See the picture in the top left? Like they've actually gone to the effort up there of putting, you know, that HTTP HDP liner around their bunding so people can do extra things as well. So that's just an extra um, thing that they've gone through. If you see the treatment pad in the middle bottom, how it's kind of a weird shape, well, this is some of the site issues that happen. That's on the Caboolture River where they were really confined with sensitive environment. And that was the only place for the treatment pad, but it was also where a cultural heritage issue was. So they had to basically build the treatment pad around it. So there's you know variations to these things. Um, if you go to the next slide, Richard, this is another um, example from PSK Environmental. So thanks again to Silvana. Just to show that when you say, yep, lime treatment, there's a lot of things to consider. You need earthwork strategies. You're saying, I'm digging up soil over here. It's going to this treatment cell. It's getting this rate of lime. And then once we pass verification, it's going to be moved somewhere else. So there's the earthwork strategy. You've got to have space to store your ag lime, space for any stockpiling of soils. You need all the collection drains and things. And see that photo up in the top right? 
with all the iron leaching. That's why the, the drains and the bunding so important is because these soils will be oxidizing on those treatment pads because it's not an instant reaction of ag lime and acid and everything's fixed instantly. There will be some byproducts and that's why it's so important that the treatment pads are contained. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is about um, performance criteria for neutralization. So how do you actually prove you've done it and it's worked? Um, the first thing is the same, that hasn't changed, but we have introduced this thing about record keeping, demonstrating what safety factor um, you know, has been applied. And that's as simple as receipts of lime purchases, taking photos and how you actually did your lime calculations. The other performance criteria haven't changed. We've basically got to say, once the soil has been limed, pH has to be above six and a half and your titratable actual acidity, which is a lab result, has to be zero. And you've got to make sure that enough of the neutralizing agent stays there. The next slide just really quickly is talking about the verification testing. So this is our post-treatment confirmation that enough is there. So once the lime has been added to the soil and it's gone through that mixing, you take samples and the guidelines specify the sampling rate for verification testing, depends on the volume of soil and your original um, net acidity results. You send those samples off to the lab and they'll get all your lab results all, all done and you get your verification net acidity, which is basically adding up all those components of it. And that's got to be less than zero. There is some allowance in the guidelines for individual samples to exceed it. So it can be slightly above zero, but it depends on the texture. But there's like a sliding sort of scale, this sample and the surrounding ones around it, you can't all fail basically. Because if you do fail verification testing, you've got to retreat the soil. And so that is another complication into it all. I might hand over to you now, Sue Ellen, I think. You want to do the next part? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, some of the other preferred management strategies that the guidelines talk about are strategies to minimise groundwater disturbance. So there's actually lots, there's lots of, there's quite a bit of information in the guidelines about how to minimise um, disturbance, but we'll just look at minimising groundwater at the moment. Um so in this diagram, thanks again, Silvana, um, you can see we've got a fairly simplistic landscape. We've got an actual acid sulfate soil and a potential acid sulfate soil. Then you go in and you dig a, a big dry hole, dewatered as well. Um, and you can see that when you start dewatering, you'll get the cone of depression and that's where you'll get some um, oxidation of acid sulfate soil. So you'll get some, you know, some metals and 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 acid and sulfate and things like that generated. So one of the um, means of trying to minimise the amount with that would form the extent of the Kona depression is to put things like sheet piling in or diaphragm, diaphragm slurry walls, something that our engineering friends told us about. Um, so that effectively could minimise the extent and the duration of any dewatering. Um, doing things like the guidelines frequently talk about doing excavations in a series of small cells. So you're only dewatering small areas rather than a one great big dry hole at the same time. Um, you need to do verification monitoring of whether that hydraulic control is effective. Uh, yes, well, that would be in the groundwater management plan that would be associated with it as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we'll move on to, oh, I, well, just before we move on, don't have to go back, but, um, I think for more information on, we, we've sort of borrowed things from the national guidelines and, and WA guidelines about groundwater disturbance, but re, for realistically for groundwater, you really need to be looking at the national guidelines that go into a way more detail. We've just got snippets in our guidelines. So um, talk to an engineer as well, not necessarily a pedologist. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of the other preferred management strategies that the guidelines talk about is one called strategic reburial. It's basically the excavation of potential acid sulfate soils, and then you place it in the bottom of uh, a void, um, preferably in not probably, definitely in reducing or anaerobic conditions. So basically in those conditions, the sulfide oxid oxidation and then acid generation is effectively permanently precluded. So it's still used a lot. Um, we've updated some of the diagrams in the new version of the guidelines. We've got an artist in our team as well. So we, we snabbed her um, to help us 
get our graphics a little bit better. Um, thanks, Helen. And um, I think we th we sort of think, you know, climate change might bring some challenges to the long-term sustainability of this particular management strategy because for it to work, the, um, the pass has to be in reducing conditions in perpetuity. So there are some challenges for that particular management strategy as well. The guidelines all no back back Richard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the other management strategy that we talk about is hydraulic separation, which is effectively the partitioning of sediment using accelerated differential settling. Um, in this section of the guidelines, I think we just changed some of the verification testing rates to make it more consistent with other parts of the guidelines. Um, we used to call this this form of management hydrosleucing or just sluicing for short. It's not really used a lot these days as far as we can gather, but it was instrumental in the creation of the Kiwana waters. Um, it was the Olympic rowing um, rowing course in the yeah, in the Olympics. Um, <laughs> um, and it was also used a lot at Kiwana. I mean, it's Twin Waters and the Sunshine Coast and a lot of the Gold Coast sandy canals back in back in the day but yeah as, as i said we're not not entirely sure but we don't think it's it's a widespread or common thing these days okay next slide please so we'll just talk a little bit about some of the non-sulfitic acidic soils so many soils can be naturally acidic and that acidity is not from the oxidation of sulfides so We've got coffee rocks and peats um, um, and those he really heavily leached iron and aluminium rich tropical soils. So the, the slide up the top right hand corner, that's classic um, soils around any of you know Sunshine Coast around Lake Karoiba and Lake Tharaba. They're, they're just yeah, they're highly leached. They will, if you, if you dig a hole in them, you will get these bright little you know, throw a lot of acid and aluminium, sorry, into the water. Um, so you will get these crystal clear lakes, but eventually um, they will stabilise just um, after a while. So they're, they're a bit different to an acid sulfate soil where, where you're going to get a long-term acidity situation. Um, the problem is that the lab methods, TAA, doesn't really distinguish between the acidity sources, and it's not always easy to predict the history of the proton. So another problem is that these soil, some of these soils can contain really, really small pyrite with no A and C. We haven't really looked into those too much in Queensland in our mapping projects, but we, we know that they've found them in WA and we suspect they might be in um, uh, like Gari and, and some of our other coastal islands as well. So marine, marine peats um, are particularly can be particularly nasty. Um, the difficulty with these soils is that talking to one of our guys up in far north Queensland who's done a lot of work in these soils and he said they effectively look the same as normal peats, but apart from the smell. So you will get the, you know, the rotten egg gas when you dig it up. But he said they look the same. The difference is these soils can have sometimes four or eight percent um, sulfur in them. So they're pretty nasty. When they go off, they'll acidify entire um, creeks and for, for, for a long time. So it's not just a one-off burst of acidity into the environment. Um, in terms of acidic soils, um, um, the guidelines talk about looking for signs or evidence of sulphide oxidation. So this could be things like jarosite, rotten egg gas, smell mottles, shwerpenite, things like that. Sometimes there can be underlying um, sulphitic materials underneath these soils as well. Um, when so it, it's really complicated because when the source of un, of acidity is unclear, you know, um, the management's not always straightforward, which is why you need to really go in and do a risk assessment to to categorise that risk. In some situations, just to complicate the whole situation, you've got um, multiple sources of acidity, and you've got highly or organic. Um, acidic ecosystems and then underlying that 
you've got the sulfitic soils. So we've got a classic example of that behind Coulomb where we've got Pleistocene coffee rock and we get the um, sulfitic soils underneath the Pleistocene coffee rock. And these are, I think, 10 or 15 metres deep. Um, so the only reason we really found them is because we, you know, dug up very, very deep hole. So, so it, it's sort of, a, it's basically with these soils, it's about minimising the risk, but you've also aligning that risk with the values of the natural environment because we don't want to change the composition of an acidophilic ecosystem, but we also don't want, you know, the nasty consequences of an acid sulfate soil being um, impacting the environment as well. Next slide, please, Richard. Just before we do, so not familiar with the term coffee rock. It's coffee rock. Coffee rock. Oh, that's a great picture there. Um, so it's basically sort of indurated sands. Um, we get that they're quite co common in um, around around the Sunshine Coast and all, all up and down the coast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they're generally of um, Pleistocene um, origin. So the guidelines also talk about um, high risk management strategies. So we've introduced one new one to the mix this time. We, we've done a section on basements and then other in-ground infrastructure where that are below the water table. And that's really um, to accommodate basements and eleva elevator shafts and tunnels and um, car parks and things like that, which um, we have a lot... It's, it's quite topical in the middle of the Brisbane CBD at the moment because there's a lot of building going on and you've got some fairly nasty marine clays down there with, you know, 6% sulphur down there. And then, then all of these structures down there, so they definitely um, can't be ignored. Okay, next one. Okay, the guidelines also talk about some unacceptable management strategies. So in this one, we've added... Uh, we've always had a section from day one or back when they were generally unacceptable management strategies. But from in 2014 onwards, we became bold and said they're unacceptable management strategies. So we've always had seawater neutralisation. So now we've added in groundwater neutralisation. And that's, again, sort of after some of the stuff that's sort of come across our desks over the last few years about some proposals in um, urban infill environments. We've included another unacceptable management strategy, which uh, has a brief discussion on unconfined groundwater dewatering. Um, and then we've also included a, a definition there as well for you. Okay. Why are you worried about hastened oxidation? Oh, it's, I don't even think it, we've ever even seen it. It was, it was, it was a concept that we came up with or that was, was talked about back in 2002. Um, it's basically, it was like sort of chucking a whole pile of stuff kind of on a treatment pad but not a treatment pad and just working it and letting it do its thing and like speeding it all up but not really uh dealing with the managing the acidity part of it the neutralizing part of it it was, yeah. know, it was a very good concept it was some, something that someone came across our desk very early in the original days and we we're like no that's not a good idea <laughs> so that's what we yeah. put it in there <laughs> yes that's right okay it's funny we just we just believe that everyone knows what these terms are these days cause we, <laughs> sorry because <laughs> we made them up in 2002 what are the consequences to someone like just looking at that uh, last statement about groundwater what, what are the consequences if their plan doesn't work and they do achieve drawdown is there a stick that you wield on them or well we don't well i, I wouldn't we don't have sticks to wield, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the Department of Environment would certainly um, be interested, I would imagine. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, for the first time, the guidelines talked about trenching, um, which is one of the – so we've – given some management strategies for trenching. So it's interesting, Christy and I look back at some of the old presentations that we were doing back in 2002, and we were talking about trenching in presentations, but for some reason they never managed it. We never managed to make it documented into the guidelines. So we've, you know, our drawings back then were very, very rough, but, you know, we've, I don't think we put any drawings in this time for these ones. So basically with trenching, as, as 
with every AS disturbance, an AS investigation is required. Um, the guidelines talk about if you can um, avoid the um, disturbance of acid sulfate soil. So this could be by keeping your trenches um, a bit shallower than, than the, those deeper trenches, obviously not always possible. Again, it talks about those things to minimise dewatering, like excavating a series of small cells. Uh, Neutralisation on a treatment pad and verification testing will be required. In some of those lower risk situations, um, there are other man management strategies as well. So like some sprinkling with neutralisation, neutralising agent, a guard layer, things like that, getting them, getting the soils back in very, very quickly. So next one, please, Richard. And next one as well. Yes, excellent. So you can see this is what we call is a, probably a, a relatively low risk trench. So um, you've got some lime sprinkling on the stockpile. There was lime underneath that as a guard layer. And then when that um, stockpile's incorporated back in, you'll get some, um, some good mixing. I'm assuming that there's some acid resistant pipes in there as well. Another good way is also to throw in some lime along the bed and banks of the, of the trenches as well. But and once... it's about um, returning it within time frames, like within 20, 24 to 48 hours is what we've said in these low risk things. And that's when you don't have to take it all off to a treatment pad. Yeah. And then once, of course, the risk increases once the water table is intercepted as well. Okay. So we'll just... Sorry, what did I say? Just, no, no, you're right. I was saying, yeah, when the water table comes in, then yeah. everything changes, yeah. Okay. So this is what we would call not a low-risk trench. Mm -hmm. So this was in a highly sensitive environment, ticked all the boxes. It's like a, a great big water treat, was it water treatment pipe through the middle of a national park. Um, so there were all sorts of approvals that were required by Department of Environment for the environmental licensing. Um, this is Gold Coast City Council did this one and by all accounts, they did a really, really thorough job. They minimize, they did what they can to minimize, you know, it was a very confined area. They didn't clear a lot. Um, they minimized the disturbance of the groundwater by using sheet piling. They excavated in a series of relatively small um, cells. Uh, there was a lot of automatic um, monitoring and, and dosing, and no doubt. I don't know where the discharge waters went, but um, we would have had to comply with some fairly strict requirements from EPA, uh, sorry, DES, Department of Environment and Science, sorry, for those not in Queensland. Um, in this instance, they, they didn't have room for, to put a treatment pad inside, so they trucked, they trucked all the marine mugs off-site and built a treatment had over there on the left that you can see they also opted not to backfill with treated acid sulfate soils so they they backfilled with clean uh, material as well okay next slide please now i'm going to pass back to chris yeah, well, so the reuse of treated acid sulfate soils, like after you've added lime to them, has been in the guidelines since day dot, but we've just sort of tightened up a few things or made people aware of some of the geotechnical issues, basically, that they're really not useful for structural fill because of that squishiness factor. Yes, and that's a technical term, isn't it? Um, and also just pointing out that if you're looking at reusing these soils for landscaping purposes, um, they will often require further amendment because they're low in organic matter. They'll be high in salts. Their structure's no good. They'll have alkaline pH and they won't have much fertility to talk about. So it's certainly a very valid use. We've seen it around the place where they've done lime treatment. They'll spread it out elsewhere because if you've passed all your verification testing, then there is no limits on what you can do with it, but it's from the structural um, point of view that you've got to consider about it. So that's just a little bit about the reuse one. Um, next slide. So, no, don't show the words yet, Richard. I got to talk first. <laughs> So one of the things that we're talking about um, that has come across our desk a bit is this treatment of small volumes of disturbances, less than 100 cubic metres. In Queensland, we have a state planning policy which triggers when you've got to think about acid sulphate soils and 100 cubic metres is the mark. But we're aware of other jurisdictions. I know down in New South Wales, they have a trigger of 50 cubic metres. And 
that, that's really small. Like this is only sort of minor works, usually residential things, maybe, I don't know, putting in a fence or something like this that you're going to generate these small volumes. And it doesn't seem practical or economic to say you've got to do a full acid sulfate soil investigation and lab analysis and everything like this for these small volumes of disturbances. Um, but if you're in some sort of known acid sulfate soil environment, less than five metres elevation and everything like that, there is still a, a possibility that there may be some um, issues um, by disturbing even small amounts of soil. And you've still to comply with your general environmental duty. So um, we can show the words now, Richard. <laughs> so we pulled together all the data from our um, Queensland government acid sulfate soil database. Um, we looked at a subset of, it, of about 8,000 samples and we came up with sort of general liming rates depending on soil texture to say if you're doing these small scale disturbances, these are the liming rates that you can use and it's based on the 95th percentile. So that's implying that um, one in five, is that right? Yeah, one in five will, um, it might not be enough, but for the other ones, it should be all good. Um, and it is only for disturbances less than 100 cubic metre cubic metres and you can't split your volume into smaller cells to try to meet this thing because that's another thing that we have seen before in the past. So um, it's just something that we tightened up and included in there and that is um, I think it's section in section seven of the guidelines in the neutralisation chapter. So the next part is that we included, Richard, is some remediation case studies. So we looked at East Trinity, which is a big site up in North Queensland where acid sulfate soils were disturbed way back in the 70s and the, the Queensland government's been remediating it. Um, we looked at a case study for the lower lakes um, in South Australia during the millennium drought, like around the Murray-Darling Basin and the issues associated with that. And then there's the remediation of an aquaculture facility in North Queensland has been included in there. So that's just got some really cool um, information about some things that people have done on these sites. Next slide, we've included some new stuff about uh, an ASS tip, which is just a one pager about dredging operations because the dredging guidelines have come out for um, acid sulfate soils. There's also nas national uh, dredging guidelines that were already in existence. And then there's some sampling guidelines and there wasn't quite consistency about how many sampling locations are required, how deep to sample and how many samples to collect and analyze. So we chatted with the authors of the dredging guidelines and we came up with this consensus. So um, that just make, helps to make it clear, provide that clarity for people. Um, and I think, Sue Ellen, you might do the next one because it's your favourite part, isn't it? Mm. It is. <laughs> okay. So um, at the um, Adelaide Acid Sulfate Soil Conference, Christy and I had the pleasure of spending some time with Del Fanning. He's a professor uh, from Maryland University. I think he's 92 years old. Um, so after hearing Del's keynote address, where he sang this poem, um, we asked him if we could include it in the guidelines. And fortunately, he said yes. But I'm not going to sing it for you. But I think it's mandatory. Uh, <laughs> if you wish to hum along, you can, to the tune of Ebb Tide, as Del did. But you can all just, you know, spend a couple of seconds humming it in your head, which we won't do. So... Um, Dell also helped us write a new ass tip on Friends of Phragmites, and he even sent us some Friends of Phragmites T-shirts, which are jarosite yellow colour. They're just lovely. Um, we're supposed to be wearing those whenever we do acid sulfate soil training workshops, but unfortunately Christy and I forgot. So <laughs> next time, we guarantee, guarantee we'll be wearing them. Okay. Next. Do you want me to move on past the poem? Or? Yes, past <laughs> the poem. Thank you. Okay, so there's um, a few other things that are in the guidelines that we're not going to talk about today, but I'll just sort of highlight that they're there. So we did some updates to closure reporting, which we found out after talking to our industry reference group because we um, the closure reporting is used quite quite a lot so we were quite excited about that we also found out that handover testing that was also featured in the 2014 guidelines as far as we can tell was never ever used so we've relegated it back to version four it never made it into version five uh, we do we do talk about it though so if anyone wants to do it they can just go and look at the technique in version four um there's quite a bit more on water quality monitoring limnological assessments we had a big section in that because um, one thing that I didn't mention earlier, but 
strategic, there was a whole heap of um, marine slimes that were generated from a hydraulic separation at the Sunshine Coast. They're buried deeply at the bottom of a canal, which is like 20 metres of water on them. So um, they did some limnological assessments back in the day to make sure those sediments wouldn't be disturbed by any winds and, and lake turnovers and things like that. So as far as we know, that's the only time the limnological assessments have been used for acid sulfate soils. Um, so it's still still relevant, but we put it in the appendix make that chapter a bit smaller. Uh, we've got some sections on management of surface and groundwater and drain maintenance as well. We've got some really cool checklists for ass investigations and EM plans that we borrowed from the Soil Science Australia RSP for acid sulfate soil. What are they? RSP ass, I think is what it's called. So that Christy and Silvana and the team over there wrote. So we've we've thrown them in here in here as well. Um, they're really good. We've got heaps of new ass tips and then lots of other useful information. But before you change slide, Richard, um, so there is a very real possibility that we will actually release version 5.1 very soon. And we've, we've noticed a couple of really minor typos, like we don't know how they got through, but, you know, we misspelled meter. And so we've got to fix that. Um, we also want to have another look at the trenching section. We don't think we've got it quite right. Um, it's nearly there. Um, so we just want to make sure that the advice that we're providing on trenching is clear and unambiguous. Um, we're also going to have a, another look at our Sally database for that small, that table that Christy showed before with for the small disturbances because we think we've put peats into the wrong category. They you know, with four to eight percent sulfur, sometimes we put them down there with with sands, which generally have much lower levels of um, sulfur sulfide. So we're just going to have a look in our database and 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 see if we can see what we need if we need to tweak that particular table. Um, so when we release the next version, we'll do our best to spread the word. We've got a, a massive email um, database of contacts in acid sulfate soils. Um, we've got all our new friends here today. Um, we'll um, publicise it on our website and, and the department does lots of stuff with social media as well. So we think that probably will happen very soon, assuming that it doesn't take long to get, get it out of the department. Okay. So... Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say um, before we finished up that this is Christy and I in our Friends of Fragmites um, T-shirts that Del Fanning sent us. Um, the reason that Christy and I were able to pull off these guidelines by World Soil Day was because we spent a lot of time locked in my office for, for like, for, you know, <laughs> for more than a few days. Um, Christy bought lots of chocolate. Um, we didn't throw it at, at each other. But... Um, <laughs> We had did have a lot of fun and we had some pretty good video conference calls with our other author Angus here who is not wearing a shirt the friend of Frank Miley shirt which is why we had to hold one up for the photo um Angus is a an amazing soil chemist um and he's also good with grammar and and dad jokes so <laughs> that's all we probably need to say uh, yeah but we've got a heap of questions <laughs> So don't you go anywhere. <laughs> All right. So straight into the early bird questions. Okay. Can... Are you going to read it or do I just yeah. start answering well, them? <laughs> I'll, I'll read them. Just hold on okay. there, see boots. Can biochar help to deacidify soils? I read that. Uh, Is anyone in Queensland doing this? Not that we know. <laughs> yeah, theoretically biochar should, but it, I mean, biochar, it's not my field of expertise, that's for sure. So that's my disclaimer at the start. But um, it depends, I think, on the temperature and the combustion that it's burnt at and everything like that as to in terms of how much alkalinity is in the substance. I know that the crew at Griffith University in Queensland, so Ch Professor Changrong Chen, and they're the guys that have been doing lots of research into biochar. So I'm going to say talk to those people and they'll be able to answer you much better. Good. Why mm -hmm. does the guideline <laughs> refer to the Queensland Sampling Guide and the link 
to the mm-hmm. national sampling guideline? Mm-hmm. Well, when we started writing version five, we had the intention of also rewriting the sampling guidelines as well. Um, and it's not my intention to write version six of these guidelines. So we thought, well, to be efficient, we'll just refer to the Queensland sampling guidelines. We'll link to the national guidelines. So if we ever do decide to update the um, sampling guidelines, we won't have to rewrite these guidelines. So it's purely at the moment in Queensland, um, the national guidelines are effectively the same thing for the Queensland guidelines. And um, I can't say that it's high on our priorities to write them. So um, unless Christy's really, really keen, <laughs> I'd say that we possibly may never rewrite them, but I cannot say never. But yeah. We also, We're on the Queensland guidelines. government website, we have it really spelt out, the differences between the mm-hmm. guidelines and how they link and everything like that on the acid sulfate soil part. So that probably helps answer that part as well. Yep, yep. Okay. Number three, worked examples, case studies would be great to follow up presentations. So I think you've shown some case studies there, so I think that's all right. Yeah, there's lots of case studies in the literature as well, um, particularly conference literature, if people want to look up those. Yeah, I think there's been nine international acid sulfate soil conferences in the last sort of 30 years, so they've all got proceedings about them and there's a lot of really cool case studies in those. Okay. Number four, the New South Wales EPA will not consider material as venom, ENM, due to TAA. What are your thoughts on this for the EPA? Well, we don't really think we know enough, enough about even what venom and M and M and M and are for us to add. I don't think it's appropriate at all for us to comment. I don't think. All right, that's, we'll yeah. put that in the too hard basket. Yeah. Number five, I'm interested in hearing a little more about non-sulfidic acidic soils and better ways to justify these are non-acid sulfate soil. Well, we sort of did talk about that in the, in the presentation. So, yeah, I think just, you know, look for evidence of acid sulfate soils like jarosite, um, Schwertmanite, rotten egg gas, those dark steel and colours. Um, yeah. yeah. It's um, section 7.6 of the guidelines. There's a little pile of dot points to say these are things that if the acidity could be from sulphide oxidation, this is what you would see. So that might help. Yeah. Okay. Question six. What are your thoughts on how the industry is doing when it comes to acid sulphate soil management? on contaminated land projects? Mm. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll tackle that one. So last night in Brisbane, Christy and I spoke at um, ALGA, the Australian Land and Groundwater Association Network. And, um, there were lots of contaminated land experts in the room. Um, they seem to know what they're doing. Um, they were keen to engage with us, but it's really, it's something our team doesn't get involved in at all. So I don't, I don't think we can really comment on that at all. Yeah, I guess that one thing I might add is that usually if you have acid sulfate soils and contaminated land on the one side, the contaminated land tends to trump your acid sulfate soils management in a lot of cases. That, that, that'll that be the priority that they focus on that. So, uh, and I guess that's the thing is that we have our blinkers on at the moment looking at acid sulfate soil management. But as Sue Allen said right at the start, it's a really complex thing. There's multiple disciplines that all interact with each other and you can't just go in looking with blinkers. You've got to consider the whole lot. So I think they're doing okay as a whole, yeah. I mean, it's their job to know both, isn't it, really? Mm. Yeah. Definition of acid sulfate oils versus venom-containing sulfidic ores. Yeah, that's the venom thing again. I'm sorry, but I'm not familiar with the New South Wales legislation about it. Neither am I. We'll need someone to send us some guidance. Number eight, any guidelines or topic regarding construction over acid sulfate soil, therefore designing bridging layer X and re- replace, excavate and replace, geogrids, reinforcement? It's an interesting one. 
Mm. Um, well, I think we sort of we did touch on this a little bit in terms of you know you just got to be careful with acid sulfate soils because you know they can be unsuitable as structural fill for load bearing materials, particularly if you neutralize them. Um, they continue to react for a long time after treatment. They can swell and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'd be getting input from a geotech engineer, in all honesty. Hmm. What about in terms of, you, you had that note about capping itself not a suitable method. No, and that was in, in our, um, so in our first version of the guidelines, 2002, we had Steve Dobos, who's a, um, well, probably got the biggest brain on the planet that I've ever come across. Uh, he's a <laughs> geophysicist. We only just met. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Richard. That's good. <laughs> and um, Steve had done a lot of work in mine rehab as a geologist. And yeah, it was he, him, he, he who believed strongly that it should be, that it, you know, it was very, capping's very difficult very hard to maintain those impermeable barriers in the long term and mm. um yeah so that's that's why from day one and we had a lot of back then with you know our um hastened oxidation it was another thing that was thrown that was bandied around a lot in the in those days before we had any management guidelines particularly in the 90s late 90s that you know um because s some of the ask consultants had come in from the mining sector back then mm. Okay, number nine, time-sensitive options to manage acid sulfate soil versus cost-effective alternatives. How do they compare in terms of risk and efficacy? Mm. Well, these take these soils do take a long time to react and to oxidise, especially clays, and the consequences are pretty high. So I don't really know what time-sensitive options exist out there. Um, um, I sort of think that the risks... The risks are likely pretty high, but, you know, don't really know what time-sensitive management options there are. Do you have yeah. any ideas, Christy? No, I mean... Mason oxidation? <laughs> no, I was going to say, like, when we were talking about our trenching examples, when it's like a, a low-risk environment and you, you're, you're above the water table and things like this and you're able to return the soil within a 24-hour period, that does negate the need for doing full scale treatment but that's like it's a really site specific you know case by case basis so i'm not yeah i'm not really sure what else to add on that one is it um is it like contaminated land that you can't take it off site to treat or no you can it, i can only talk about the queensland experience but you can definitely take uh, say raw acid sulfate soils and take them off site to tr other treatment facilities and things like that. Yeah, you can transport it around the place. Yeah. And they need to be specially licensed for that, or is that just coming as part of the management plan? You'd specify an area and say that's where we're going to do it. Is that exactly. It's also, it all needs to be specified in the management plan. Yep. Okay. Next question. Practical management of acid sulfate soil. Oh, That's the whole talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, we I missed think... the one before. Didn't we? <laughs> we did, sorry. Uh, number 10, please discuss the differences and similarities between acid rock and or soil with sulfitic ores and acid sulfate soil, potential acid sulfate soil. I think Christy sort of did touch on this earlier. Like it's it's effectively the same. It's the same chemical. It's same pyrite. They're, yeah, they're framboidal. So they're small. They have a large surface area, and then they're just highly reactive. So there's yeah, there's plenty of literature on acid mine drainage, um, and I think we actually link people to it on page one of guidelines. So I'd go and have a look at those links. Doesn't it come down a bit to the you know, that's the scale of the pyrite mineralisation itself. So when you're dealing with mining, you've got pretty massive mm. yes. wind fractures and that sort of thing. So mm. yeah, absolutely. different approaches yeah. to assess 
Yeah, I think the sim- the similarity is that the chemistry is the same. So that you know, of course, you remember the chemical equation I put up, but it's still the same thing: pyrite and oxygen and water. You're going to get acid and iron being produced. That part is the same, but the scale of the reactions and how quickly it takes and all that sort of things, the kinetics of those reactions are very different in the soils compared to your acid mine drainage sort of situation. Yeah, I suppose the question might be leaning towards given this is now sort of a an official guidance document how does that interface with guidance for you know dealing with acid mine drainage no we wouldn't see that it would be a guidance that you would use for acid mine drainage no they're very different yep yeah all right Question number 12, are there any publicly available case studies demonstrating the effective implementation of the acid sulfate soil management framework? I think you've answered that one. Um, did you want to add anything to that or are you happy with what you said? No, that's fine. Okay. Question 13, can you discuss the investigation and monitoring of groundwater when it is unavoidable to dewater trenches in potential acid sulfate soil? Oh, I'd say go and have a look at the Western Australia guidelines and the national groundwater guidelines because you'd need to do an investigation and then management. And then the West, the WA guidelines got all sorts of stuff about um, effluent treatment. Um, um, there's things like minimising dewatering, automatic dosing. Um, doing you can a talk to Hydra Terra about the groundwater monitoring. I think we could there you go. Them. Okay. A nice okay. little... Thanks for putting that question in. Um, number 14, what is the longest time period that acid sulfate soil geochemistry has been monitored following disturbance? Well, the main one that comes to my mind would be the East Trinity remediation um, project that the Queensland government's been doing since pretty much since about the year 2000. Um, so it's up... Uh, Trinity Inlet, which is opposite Can CBD. Um, it's a 750 hectare tidal wetland site that was funded and drained in 1970 for sugarcane. The sugarcane didn't last very long. Um, and I think they were at, at its peak, they were getting about 3,000 tonnes of acid discharge into Trinity Inlet every year. Um, some of the, there's a really good case study that Michelle Martins from, from, Desi in Queensland wrote for our guidelines. So I'd, I'd go and have a look at that. It's really interesting. One of the interesting things that they did discover was that um, their the jarosite ultimately dissolved and then the iron reducing bacteria produced by carbonate. So I don't think they ever anticipated that there would be such rapid dissolution and weathering of the jarosite and schwertmanite at, at the site. So um, nowadays, like there, there was a lot of organic matter at the site. Um, particularly after they they opened up the floodgates. Um, it was all hydrologically worked out so that there'd be twice daily inundation up to about 0.5 of a metre AHD. And um, so there's a lot of, because the tide was was back in, the acidified, all the melaleucas and ultimately um, perished, released a lot of organic matter into the system. So I think the organic matter and the seawater were the things that, and then hydrated lime as well, the things that sort of set that remediation off. And, yeah, it's a really good case study. Have a, have a read in the guideline. Sorry, I just got kicked out because the internet died at work, but I'm back again. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, question 15, last of the early bird questions, I think. How do you decide which of the three S pocus suites complete TAA or TPA are selected for analysis? You want me to do that one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so back in earlier versions of the guidelines, there were different way, different lab methods that you could use to analyse acid sulphate soils, and there was the SPOCUS suite, uh, the chromium reducible sulphur suite, all sorts of different things like that. We're really seeing a push in the last couple of years that we tend to just use the, people just use the chromium reducible sulphur suite. And so chromium reducible sulphur measures your potential acidity, 
titratable actual acidity test measures the actual acidity part and then you have your net acid soluble sulfur measures your retained acidity and you have acid neutralizing capacity where back titration is your ANC. They're the four main tests that we tend to see these days. Spocus is still used in Queensland. It's still an option, but it's not really used anywhere else uh, around the place anymore. So if you were to submit a sample to the lab to say, I want Spocus analysis done, they'll actually do all those trials that you're talking about there themselves. It's There's like a decision tree built into it, depending on the pH of the soil. So you don't actually choose which ones you get to do. Um, but as I said, these days, it tends to be more the chromium reducible sulfur analysis. They're the ones that are, are more common. They're probably a slightly quicker turnaround and they're a cheaper lab method. Um, so that's why Spocus isn't that common these days. Okay. Um, we'll now move to the are you happy to keep going a bit longer, guys? We've actually got 24 <laughs> questions in the Q&A. Okay. Unless people really want to leave and have a life, otherwise, no. <laughs> so there's 158 people listening to you, so obviously, okay. uh, yeah. uh, can this be recorded? Yes, is the answer, and it is, and you can find it on our website uh, by about. Monday or Tuesday of next week. So you will get a recording. Can you please repeat which university is doing the short course for the acid sulfate soil management, which was mentioned at the start of the webinar? Yeah, that's Southern Cross University um, based out at Lismore. Excellent. Now, there's a question here from Alana Gaspari. Are there plans to update the guidelines to incorporate off-site acid sulfate soil treatment and reuse? For example, stockpiled. Hmm. Not at this stage. <laughs> Have you had enough, Sue? <laughs> <laughs> um, what, uh, for taking stuff off site, um, I mean, the management principles and your management strategies are the same, whether the stuff's treated on site or elsewhere, you've still got to do as per the guidelines and meet that performance criteria and things like that. So it, it's not a different set of rules if it's, you know, treated here or treated over there. Mm -hmm. And there is a there is an ass tip on the reuse of, acid, of treated acid sulfate soils. Yeah. I think there was actually, in memory, I think there was plans years and maybe five, ten years ago to do such a guideline um, back when we had the, around the time some of the national guidelines were being written, but we definitely weren't involved in that. And, and as far as I know, it's never, it's never happened. But might be, I think the Western Australian um, as the sulfate soils teams were the ones who were sort of running with that. So maybe talk to them. If you're um, doing a contaminated land project and you excavate soil and you decide to dispose off site, do the disposal criteria address that? Do they, um, is there overlap there or not? Or is it sort of not really considered as part of? disposal in that sort of scenario. I don't know if I ask that perfectly, but for these contaminated land practitioners, if they're assessing stockpiles for off-site disposal, are there off-site disposal criteria they're needing to meet? Mm. Not really sure, but I, from speaking to some of the contaminated land people last night, they were like two of the consultants were saying that they, you know, they do it all in the one report, like that deals with acid soil soils and contaminated lands, and other consultants said they do them as two separate things. So, right, yeah, but I really don't know. We we do not. We have nothing to do with contaminated land. It's it's handled by a different department. Okay, Simone Labuschagne, if I got that right, is guidance available for management and mitigation? responsibilities associated with historical acid sulfate soil disturbance mm. e.g site developed in the 1980s but still operation well it's, i'd say the um probably the best reference out there is um mitch talau from new south wales i don't know which department wrote some remediation guidelines i don't know if they were in the 90s or early 2000s and um 
as far as we know, other than the remediation case studies that we've published, they're probably the only two bits of literature mm. out there on S remediation. I, and I, I think Mitch's stuff was more like broad acre mm, remediation. It was, yeah. um, I don't know if this question is talking about like a, an existing site that's still being developed or something. That's that's a different. That's just complicated, basically. Um, mm. Yeah, and there's nothing specific about it. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next one we've already answered. Uh, yes, these are being recorded. Uh, question from Todd O'Brien. Following neutralisation, the guidelines recommend the use of average concentrations if a sample is reported with net acidity greater than zero with an upper limit, e.g. 62 mole for clay. However, the performance criteria states post-neutralisation, the soil pH is to be greater than 6.5 and the titratable actual acidity is zero. Can you confirm whether the intention is for averages to be applied to pH and TAA as well? No, you can't. <laughs> you can't average them. <laughs> I think that's my, but that's that's a good, uh, we'll re-look at that and just make sure that mm. it's um, not am ambiguous there. But yeah, we'll have a double check, but it's not meant to average out your pHs and things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the answer is no, but we'll come we'll back, back to you. We'll, we'll check. Yeah. yeah. Jason Du, Spocus and CRS. Which method should be used in general? Can you please comment on the advantages of and the limitations of each method? Um. <laughs> Yes, we can. You should talk to a laboratory person, though they're far more knowledgeable than us. But um, generally, if you have a highly organic so soil, um, you should stick with the chromium reducible sulfur too. That's it doesn't get the interference from the organic sulfur. Um, Spocus is kind of like a more complete picture. You get a far, you get much more analytes and you can sort of, you know, say what, what's, you can see a better picture of what's going on. As I said earlier, though, most most of the time these days, the chrome reducible sulfur is the preferred one because it's cheaper and a quicker turnaround. But yeah, I'd talk to your lab person or have a look in depth in the uh, national lab guidelines, but then there's also the 2004 Queensland lab guidelines. They talk a lot about the differences between both of those methods. Right, next question. In the history of acid sulfate soil management, neutralisation seems to be the most common method and there seems to be a lean toward over-neutralisation to allow for incomplete mixing coating, allowing for highest level of net acidity, etc. Has there been any thought towards sustainability of agricultural lime supply in Queensland regions, <laughs> potential for over-treatment in acidophilic environments mm -mm. well that's why there's always that push to do a risk assessment particularly in those acidophilic environments because no one wants to change the composition of those ecosystems but we have certainly not looked at liming supplies in queensland no, no. <laughs> but it's it's a very valid point yeah it is yes, the thing it is. about absolutely. we don't we don't want to lime the world. That is not no. what we're in intending to do. Yeah, absolutely. Don't want to lime the world. That's right. You, you did have in the in your discussion about the sort of shell size or the fragment size. I can't remember what the size was. That point so, five of a millimeter. Yeah. And that it goes to the lab. Things get crunched up, so it's an over it's it's an overestimate of the neutralizing capacity. So is there any way the lab can screen out those larger chunks? Is that what you... Uh, yeah, like the all visible shell should be removed. Um, they can go through like your different size sieves and things like that. Like, um, But most of the lab methods are done on a two mil sieve sample. So anything bigger than... Uh, anything less than two mils will get will go through so it gets a bit tricky i was talking to some lab guys from als last night um and they were looking at trying to do different sieving fractions to do that so it, it's still an evolving area but at the moment no mm, i think it's easier to get the shells out of a sandy soil rather than a clay or a marine clay yeah, exactly i reckon <laughs> um Ben Perry's got a question. Hi, thank you for the great presentation. There you go. It is 
relatively easy to talk about verification laboratory testing for total titratable acidity in the Australian context. As far as I'm aware, there are no laboratories in New Zealand that do this test. So all tests must be shipped to Australia. And now we have the $1,500 plus GST sterilisation fee on top. Wow. Does anyone know of a lab doing testing in New Zealand to speed up this process and reduce costs? This potentially makes projects not feasible in the New Zealand context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, uh, no. I, I mean, maybe talk to some of the labs here who are in the NADA accredited scheme, and I'm assuming there'd be an equivalent thing in New Zealand that they might be aware of, but I don't know anyone off the top of my head, no. It's good to see some samples coming our way rather than going the other way. <laughs> Dioxins, we used to have to ship to New Zealand. Um, at a construction site, can dewatering alone effectively manage leachate from neutralisation without the impervious soil layer? Not quite sure what that means. No, I'm a bit confused. No. I think what they're saying is if we're managing the site hydraulically, do we really need an impervious layer? So they're talking about treatment pads. Yes, yeah, so it's a bit of both, I think. So. Um, our, the, the recommendation is that you do have that compacted base and you have that guard layer underneath because it's to prevent the vertical leachate. So, yes, the, the vertical movement, you know, of any leachate and things like that. So I would say, yeah, you do you've got to stick with it. Even if you're dewatering, so you're effectively capturing that any leachate that's coming through. Are you 100% sure you're capturing it all? I don't know. You'd have to monitor it a fair bit. Yeah, mm. that's exactly right. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I guess that's the, the other important thing about the guidelines is that they don't preclude other things happening. I mean, you can try other techniques. You can do other things like that, but it just will need a bit more justification, pilot trials, uh, talking to your regulators and getting that approvals and things like that ahead. It's it, it Just because it's something that's not in the guidelines doesn't mean you can never do it. That's a good point. Meren Asadabadi has a question. Section 7.2.2 of the guidelines allows for some samples to exceed verification testing target for large volumes. What is the intention of large in the context of volume? That's a good uh, question. Large is usually over a thousand tonnes. That that's what we've kind of stuck with usually. Like that's what it relates back to the action criteria and things like that. Anything over a thousand tonnes, you go back down to that 0.03%. So I'd say large is a thousand, but we'll check. <laughs> that's another yeah. one. We'll just double yeah. check that. Because we did try and sort of get away from all of those sort of vague, vague terms, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll definitely have another look at that one. Okay. Farah Ali, what pH endpoint would you recommend for titratable actual acidity? The National Acid Sulfate Soil Guideline version I have, June 2018, says to titrate to an endpoint of 6.5 pH. However, the lab titrates to an endpoint of 8.3 pH, which increases that final mm. TA value. Do you normally request a 6.5 pH endpoint? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I would go with the and, National Guidelines. Yeah. Talk to... Um, your lab. Bring up, yeah, talk to the lab, bring up Graham Lancaster at EAL and ask him. He's the one who wrote them. <laughs> he could do that, but I'm sure it's to an endpoint of 6.5, yeah. Okay, the next question, I think you answered in the chat, but Alana Gaspari, are there any lab tests that can be done to determine the source of acidity from soils to distinguish between acid sulfate soil and naturally acidic soils? Not that I know of. No, not that I know of. Okay. Anonymous attendee, is there any guidance included on MG oh. of non-destructive digging and VAC truck residue waste oh. or treatment? No, no, there's not. I've only recently discovered that that's a thing. 
I've got some puddings done at my place. I don't know what they did with my soil. It's interesting, this whole dewatering thing, isn't it? That's a big one. Um, Justin Dury, unfortunately, I have to leave for a training session, but about Coffee Rock, I've heard HW, highly vesicular basalt, bordering on scoria called Coffee Rock. Oh, oh. Yeah. okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it's one of those terms that might have been used in a few ways. Yeah. Um, Adam Fletcher is treated potential acid sulfate soil slash acid sulfate soil classified as waste in Queensland. Not as far as I know. Hong Vu, great talk. Thank you. Can you please elaborate <laughs> on seawater and groundwater neutralisation? Really? <laughs> <laughs> What if you've only got one more question after this? <laughs> well, we'd really have to like. There's a whole there's a whole section on it in the in the guideline. I just say go and read the guide. I can go and have a look at it and read it out. No, nah, it's all right. <laughs> it sounds like they've addressed it in the guidelines, Hong. Yeah, uh, you'll need to read them. Yeah, um, David Metcalf, fantastic talk, guys. Thanks so much for presenting this. There you go. One thing we often encounter in our New South Wales LGA, brackets Wollongong, is soils with extremely low pH with very low acid reducible sulphur, if that's the right term. Given we are asked to investigate by council when we are within 500 metres of potential acid sulphate soil areas, even mapped as low risk of potential acid sulphate soil by our council, we often get hits of reducing pH and or low pH in KCL. How do we separate these soils, which are probably acidic, from potential acid sulfate soil? Um, you mentioned it's difficult from lab results alone. And how do we differentiate or decide on treatment strategies, including if they are actually required? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very topical, topical question for New South Wales from what we gather. <laughs> I know that um, Mark Becky spoke about that in the previous yeah, webinar. He did too, yeah. And I guess what it's coming down to is that yeah. these things are getting picked up because of their location, like proximity to no, you know, to acid sulfate source areas. But I mean, you're talking about coastal environments, and that's where you get a lot of acidic soils too. It's where you get highly leached soils and things like that. So yeah, you know, iron and aluminium rich soils, they'll be acidic as well. So it is tricky. Um, as we said, we've got that section in the guidelines about these acidic non-sulfidic soils about some little points you can have a look at when it comes to management um we did write a couple of examples to say that perhaps um you know rather than full treatment on a neutralization neutralization pad and all that sort of stuff it's like lime perimeters around the site or a bit of ag lime dusting of stockpiles and things like that but it does come down to that site specific case by case assessment essentially um but we are conscious of not wanting to you know, over treat things if possible. Hmm. Okay. Um, a bit confused because it's still saying there's 15 questions to go, but I haven't got any more in front of me. Um, I think that's, oh, there they are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you happy to keep going, team? Sure. <laughs> Get them all over and done with, eh? Yeah. <laughs> then you won't have to send lots of written ones. Okay. Brian McRae, why is neutralised acid sulphate soil unsuitable for landfill? Is this just based on waste avoidance or are there other reasons? I think because our landfill sites are, you know, few and far between, so we don't want to put something in there unnecessarily. Okay, David saying we've answered most of the question uh, back in question five, so that's good. In Ingy Hersiger, why can't you dispose of untreated acid sulfates or to landfill? Because um. <laughs> you'll just get, if it's untreated, you're just going to open up a whole 
can of toxic brew and leachate that can then mix with all the other things that are in a landfill site. So uh, not a good idea. There are, I know there were and still are a couple of sites in Queensland which are licensed to take untreated acid sulfate sores. So they are fully, you know, they're properly lined, they're groundwater monitored, all sorts of things like that. So there, there are specialist sites which can take it. But the last I checked, I, I, feel, I feel like there was only one left in southeast Queensland that actually did that. So there may be more in other areas, but there's not many around. It's a fair point though, right? Because the landfill's designed to handle a yes. containment facility. Really? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's it like yeah, it's you can do it. It's finding the sites that will take it, how many there okay. are, and where they can do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, not a question, just for your information. They won't treat potential acid sulfate soil if asbestos has been identified, because the mixing may expose and generate fibres. So that's from Pam. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, next one. We've been asked about the uses of concrete washout material uh, as a replacement for ag lime. Are there any concerns around the use of this as an alternative? I presume that's like crushed concrete, is it? Washout material. Yeah. Um, there's heaps of other products which have neutralizing potential like you're looking at something with you you're wanting calcium carbonate essentially so there's lots of things out there um industry byproducts cement kiln dust red mud all sorts of things which have been used in the past i guess the things to consider is the solubility the ph of those um, products what else is in there it's often they're not just pure calcium carbonate there's other bits and pieces there and the other thing to work out is that all the things in the guidelines for your liming rates and performance criteria and all that are all based on ag lime so you're going to have to readjust them all and it might be necessary back to the pilot trials and talking to regulators and things like that but it's possible yes no. so Alan, do you want to add anything no sorry all right hopefully you're not getting that noise in the background no um, brett thomas with respect to question seven as you have said virgin natural Bergen material. Oh, that is that is it venom that he's talking about? Ah, mm. okay. Is defined as a natural material that does not contain any sulfitic or sulfuric soils or any other sulfitic rock or waste. Soil with any form of or source of sulfides would classify as acid sulfate soil contaminated soil rock is covered by acid mine drainage management requirements chemistry is the same the reaction rates anc sources trigger values and risk acceptance criteria based on disturbance will differ thanks yep, for that yep. brett thomas colin ahern <laughs> cool there's Cole Hearn can make a general comment. Acid sulfur <laughs> soil and mining. Oh, okay. <laughs> thanks, Cole. Um, thanks. Michael Mills has the maximum timeline for strategic reburial been updated? Excavation to reburial time? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's changed. It's still what it was before. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next question, Ingi Hersinger. Contaminant, contaminant acid sulfate sure should be dealt with concurrently. Management measures apply to both and you need to deal with it together. You can't ignore the acid sulfate soil just because it's contaminated. Yep, good call. Um, Navjot Carr, this we can uh, quite see that question. Here we go. With acid sulfate soil management for the trenches section said to do minor treatment before backfilling, but do we have any options for the backfilling within 24 hours without treating in accordance with Table 5? Stockpile options for untreated acid sulfate soil. 
Oh, it's a bit contradictory and raised by a client. It's a good point. Yeah, um, that's the issue that we um, are having a much closer look at. Um, I think if you look at the stockpiling tables, there's still requirements for dusting of the stockpiles and a guard oh, layer as well. So we, yeah, it is, it is. We agree it's a little bit ambiguous. So that's that will be version five point one addressing that particular issue. And the thing too with the stockpiling section, that's if you're doing lime treatment and for some reason. You've, you can't get the results back from the lab quick enough or whatever like that and you've got an excess of soil that you've got to move off a treatment pad um, and before the next lot comes in, that's what that stockpiling is for. So it's not like just stockpiling for the heck of it. So, mm. yeah, that, it, it was a bit, there is a bit of a mixed message there. Yes. Okay. Ingi Hersiger, I would use Espocus only in a marine setting where you anticipate lots of shells. It gives you an interesting breakdown of calcium magnesium concentrations, which helps to support the shell neutralization story. If you yep. don't see shells but get a lot of calcium and ANC, then this can support your argument that tiny shells are present. Yep, totally agree with that. That's what this focus gives you uh, more analytes to look at so you can get a bigger picture of what's going on. Mehan Asadabari, thanks, Christy and Sue Ellen, and Richard, of course. <laughs> um, and more thanks there. Mark Downey, guidance, neutralizing rates for small disturbances, less than 100 cubic metres. Are they Queensland specific or could they be extrapolated elsewhere in Australia? Well, they're based on Queensland data. Um, like, like, uh, I'm sure that other government agencies who've had an active assets office or mapping program probably also have a heap of data in their databases that they could analyse. But um, I don't really see any reason why you wouldn't couldn't use them elsewhere. Maybe... Mm -hmm. I'd maybe be a little bit hesitant about WA because of those, you know, because of the yeah, fans over there. Um, but other than that, I, and they're, they're, those fans over there are really poorly buffered. So I'd be, yeah, bit risk, bit cautious about using them in WA. But I think other than that, yeah, I mean, we you, you get variable sulfide results all over the place. We thought we had the record in Queensland of 16.6% S, but I found out just recently that Tasmania has results above 20% S. So I was like, what? We lost our record. <laughs> well, I think you've got close to the record of the number of participants in a webinar. <laughs> um, I really want to thank you both for presenting today. It's been fantastic. And uh you know, it's been great to have such a big audience to hear. I guess it's a real lesson in persistence, this uh, this manual. And, you know, thanks very much for putting such a guidance document together and sticking at it because uh, there's a lot of good practical information there for everybody. So many thanks to you both. And, um, look, if anyone no has further questions, shoot, shoot email through and we'll um, communicate. Yep. I think, can I add one last thing is that, yeah, we, you know, we wrote, spent a lot of time doing these guidelines, but it's certainly been a very big collaborative effort. And if you look at that industry reference group, there's close to 50 people that have had input into it and, you know, gave a lot of their time to make this a, a practical document. So, yeah, team effort, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, you know, if you think about, you know, from 2000, there's probably, you know, 70 or 80 people who, industry experts who, who've contributed. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's just led to the success of the document, why it is such a practical document, because we've had such big input from industry yep. and academics. <laughs> well, there you go. Thanks to everyone, and thanks very much for joining us today. Thank okay. you. See ya. Thank you. All right. Bye.